Hi there everybody, Chris Schmidt here with another Grayscale Gorilla tutorial. In this one, we're going to be trying to create a wacky waving inflatable tube man. So, uh, we're going to be using Cinema 4D R17 and just a couple quick notes at the beginning. This is kind of continuation of my SIGGRAPH presentation where I was using a lot of dynamics in order to do some rigging. And I made this cool squid guy, but in that one, I didn't really show how I created it. So I figured we would kind of put a character together from scratch here. And I figured there's not really kind of a more deceptively simple character than this because he's just a guy in a T-pose, just a cross. Um, but we want to make it dynamic and controllable and just fun to play with. So there's going, it's going to be very specific. This is a fairly advanced rigging tutorial. And it might take a while. It's going to be, we're going to have to be very meticulous with the things we put together here. But, uh, you know, we can go ahead and take a look at some of the reference here. We just got a nice big fat tube in the, in, down the center and then just two shorter arms here. And that's what, what we're going to be aiming for. So let's jump right on into Cinema 4D R17, and we're going to start immediately with our dynamic kind of skeleton. So these are some techniques I've been tinkering with lately, and it's a lot of fun, and let's just see how far we can push it here. So uh, we want to create a dynamic chain here. So I'm going to start with a cylinder, and I'm going to make it 20 units tall, and let's just say 20 unit radius. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And I only want eight segments around, because we want to keep this pretty low poly. Now we could be going with cubes, but cubes were just a little too low poly for me. Now, uh, right away, we're gonna we're gonna want this thing editable, I think. So uh, we want to weld the caps together. The quickest way to do that for me is always just I'm gonna hold down the alter option, create a connect. Now it puts it inside a connect. I can make that editable. Boom! It's all baked down. The caps are welded. Delete the font tag because we don't need it. And now you can see what we we're dealing with. This is as few polys as we can have uh, set up here for us to continue. So. Uh, what is the first thing we need to do? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is copy and paste it and get a second one. And I'm going to hold down shift and pull this up 20 units. So they're exactly 20. They're just touching right there. So what do we need to do now? Well, the bottom one should be static. It should be stationary. It's not moving anywhere. So I'm going to right click on it. And I'm going to add a simulation collider body. So it's dynamic, but it doesn't move. This next one, I'm going to right click and I'm going to add a simulation rigid body because this one is supposed to move but we need to connect these somehow. So the way we're going to connect it is by creating a simulate dynamics connector. So we've got a connector type. So I wanna move this up, I think 10 units because 10 is gonna be right in between the two. Let's even change our display mode so we can see the, uh, the edges. NB will show our polygons. So now we see we have this connector and it's right in the correct spot, but it's not the right type of connector yet. What type do we want? Well, the type of connector should not be hinge. It should be a cardan. What's great about cardan, it's like a two axis hinge. So with this one, uh, like with a normal kind of uh, hinge, like we could, we could rotate it like that. Uh, but with this one, we can rotate it, let's say up and down and left and right. Only two axes, but it can't twist depending on the angle. And that's what we want. We don't want this twisting around, but we do want to be able to tilt kind of left and right, forward and backward. And that's what we're going for. And in order to do that, we need to rotate this, I think 90 degrees on P. So cool. Now you can see that like in theory, what this should be doing is rotating, be able to rotate like that. And it should be able to rotate like that. That's what we're telling it it should do. So this is what this card, uh, this connector is doing, this cardan. I'm going to make a child of the base one, the one on the bottom. Why don't we even go ahead and name that base? In fact, even before we go any further, I want to rename this. I'm just going to rename this uh, DYN for dynamic, DYN for dynamic, <clears throat> just so that we're not using the word connect, because that's what this is going to be giving us, and you'll see why later. So you see, I made a child of the base. So what do I want this connect to? Well, I want this connector to connect from the base to this other this other dynamic object. So it's going to be the dynamic object. And now I'm also going to make a duplicate of this into this next one. I'm going to move it up 20 units. So it's sitting right at the top. Cool. And now what do I want this one to do? I want this one to link from itself to, I don't know, I'm going to clear that one out. It doesn't have a, a, something to connect to yet. So what do we do? Well, I'm going to copy and paste and move it up 20 units. Boom, boom, 20 units. Well, cool. Now I've done that. This one now has something to connect to. So I'm going to go ahead and tell it to connect to dynamic one. Cool, now we got two of these. Now this is gonna take a while. We need a bunch of these. But what's great about this technique is we're gonna be able to double our speed every time. So I can grab both of those. And you see, I'm not affecting the base. The base was like, it's static. It shouldn't be moving with all these other ones. And that that's like, you know, it's forming the initial link. But these other ones, I can grab both of them, copy, paste, move them up and hold down shift. And you see 40 units, because we're using nice clean numbers, 40 units perfectly matches this up. 
And now we know that this bottommost one hasn't connected to anything yet. So I can grab that one and say connect onto this one. Now what's great about this is when I copy and paste, it's actually remembering all of the in-between connections from the ones I currently have. So now if I grab these four, I can copy, paste, and now I can hold down shift to move these up exactly 80. And you'll see, well, I mean, let's go and grab that. We know that this one is the one that doesn't have a connection. So let's grab that one and I'm going to connect that. But you'll see that all the other ones I, can, I copy and pasted are already all linked to each other, except for the top one, because that's on the end of the chain. So that means we can keep on doubling the speed. So let's do that again. Copy, paste, get them again, move them up 160 this time. I don't, don't know what the amount will be. I just visually pull it up until it looks correct. Uh, this connector goes to number eight. Now I can go ahead and select all of those, copy, paste, and now grab, oh, before I move, oh, make sure I pull these up. So I'm going to drop these to uh, 320 or 40 there was what this one was. And this is actually looking like a pretty good height to me. Maybe we could go one higher, but let's, let's, mm, I'm not even sure, but let's make sure we make this connection. So let's go ahead and connect that one in the same way. 15 is now connected to 16. You know what? I, th I think that's good. I think that's good for now. So uh, now the one thing we need to note is, uh, well, let's go, just go ahead and hit play and see what we get. Okay, you see something moved and you can't have this chain, but the top didn't move. Well, the top didn't move because we still have a connector up on the top and it's not connected to anything. So it's not doing anything. So I can just turn that one off. Uh, we might make it longer, so I'm going to leave it there, but I'm just going to turn it off. And why don't we right away just go ahead and save this. Uh, I'll make a new folder here for tutorial. And I'll save them as number one. Boom. Okay, cool. So we've got this file saved because, you know, who knows what we mess up. We want to go back to the step. Cool. So now if I were to hit play, we should see it's going to be able to kind of fall over and boom, we kind of got the snake. So that's looking pretty good. Immediately, we know we're going to need more frames. So I'm just going to set this up to 999. Nice, nice and quick to type. Stretch it out. So we got about a thousand frames here to play with. And we've got a dynamic joint, joint chain. Now, something important to know if you're not familiar with these uh, connectors is a connector by default tells it to ignore collisions between this object and this object, which means this one can pass through this and its parent because both of them being being told to ignore, but that one cannot ignore that one. So that means this should not be able to pass through itself. So you see how it kind of piles up and starts falling there. So that's actually really good for us. So we built this chain in this way because it was really easy to copy and paste these and they're actually all properly numbered correctly by doing it in this method. If we kind of copy and paste it or manually manually duplicated, the numbers would be all mixed up and whatnot. But this all went pretty well. But uh, for a couple different reasons, we have, I want to now build these into a hierarchy. So what, I, what that means is I want to take number 31 and make it a child of 30 and then make 30 a child of 29. And we just have to go ahead and do this manually and go ahead and just keep dropping them in carefully. Make, we don't want to mess this part up. You know, if we mess up, we can fix it. But we would, if we leave it broken, this would very much mess things up. So, like I said, no way around this. We just have to keep going. And you see that the chain's starting to get a little bit of pain to move all the way up. So we can, like, collapse that down and continue because it didn't really change anything. And just keep going. Keep going. You can do it. Here we go. Almost there. Only 10 more. Yeah. Here we go. You know what? Everyone's going to just have to do these things manually. Now, if we're doing a, like, a lot longer of a chain, we could potentially build a rig with some espresso that would do this differently. But this chain is short enough where I'm, I'm not worried and at the quickest way. It takes too long to do espresso. So as long as we do this properly, we have the file saved, so we can always go back to that step. So I'm feeling like we're all good here. So uh, now we can, this is a neat trick. If you hold down command control, if I minimize, then you see they're all kind of collapsed. If I hold down command control and expand, they all expand. And you'll see once just by the way we built the hierarchy that we get all of our nice uh, geometry here, the dynamic objects lined up, and we get all of our connectors lined up. So in this particular setup, it's very easy to go and grab all the connectors, and it's very easy to go and grab all of our dynamic objects. So that, that's another useful way of just the way we happen to build this rig here. So it's looking pretty good. I want to immediately save this as another file. We'll be saving quite a few of these just so we can always go back. Uh, and now nothing should have changed. If I hit play, it's identical. So cool. Nothing changed. But uh, something that's a little bit useful here is we can now delete most of these dynamics tags. So we have the top one, which is on the base, and then we have the first dynamic object. Everything below that we can delete. So I can get rid of all those. And now this top one, because these are all children now, I can grab that topmost one and I can say that it should filter down, oh, it should inherit down to the children. And now if I hit play, once again, identical, but now we only have one tag to worry about. So now when we make changes, we don't have to make changes to all the tags, only the one, uh, another very useful thing. So what what is the next thing we want to do here? Well, uh, we want this to be waving around. And why don't we start prototyping right now? We could go and start trying to attach the arms right now, but we're not sure that we like the way this is working yet. So let's, let's work on this bit first. 
So what I think we want is some wind. We want some wind blowing up. And why don't, why, why don't we right away just go ahead and create some wind. Let's go into simulation, particles, wind. So we've got wind. It's going to blow on Z forward. So I'm going to point that straight up. And we can go ahead and hit play. And I don't think we're going to see much. It might be a little different, but not much. That's because wind right now is quite weak. I'm going to collapse that down so we can see the hierarchy a little better. Our wind is very weak. So let's go ahead and set this up to like 55. As soon as I hit 55, it is now strong enough to blow this up into the air. Cool. Now let's rewind and nothing's happening. And that's because the wind is strong enough to just keep blowing it perfectly straight up and it's not very interesting. So something we might do here would be let's just crank up some turbulence. Crank the turbulence up to 100%. Let's give it some frequency so it's actually animating and let's give it some scale. And once again, it doesn't really seem to be doing anything. There's no, there's no, nothing too interesting here. So we could tilt it off to the side a little bit and now we will actually see a little bit of the wind kind of waving in there. Um, it's interesting, and, and now it's moving around. We get a little bit of waving. It's actually pretty good, but we want to go further. Um, so actually, a couple things to note there as well. Okay, let's say that we're still rotated at just 90 degrees straight up, and let's get rid of that turbulence. So we're just back to our boring old straight up wind. But So we've got that wind kind of countering gravity, so that's kind of neat. But we can now go and grab a simulate particle turbulence, and now I'm going to set this immediately up to 55, and let's give ourselves a reasonable scale of about 100% which should kind of give us a cloud of noise. You see how you kind of saw the scale in which it was bending. You see right there, that's the scale of this. If I were to make this really tiny on the initial, you see how it gets kind of kind of jittery everywhere. And we made it really big at the beginning. You see how the overall one is bending? So around 100 in this rig, 100, 200, is going to give us these nice kind of like wavy bulges. So right away here, we're getting some nice wafting in the wind and that the turbulence is giving us some nice random. That's all working very well, and I totally do want to keep this randomness, this turbulence. But let's uh, let's go back another step and and think about the way a wacky, waving, inflatable arm man works. Uh, there's a fan down here, and it's blowing wind, and it can't. It's not. It's a perfect amount of wind where it can't quite sustain it. But it's always kind of like it's always sending up like these ripples through it. It's constantly kind of feeding back from the source, and the effect that we have going right now while we're getting some nice waviness, doesn't have that vibe of this filling up with air from the bottom up to the top. So how might we do that? Well, uh, we might get that by grabbing wind and giving it a fall off. So I'm going to give it a spherical fall off. Let's make this bigger. I'm going to set the scale up to 200%. And then we have a bigger wind. We can give it maybe a little more fall off. So it's a bigger wind, but it's got fall off. So it's only affecting things up to this point. If I were to hit play, it's probably just going to fall right out of the scene because the wind isn't strong enough. Plus, it's only here at the bottom. So we're going to want this to travel along our entire dynamic chain. So how can we do that? Well, the, there's actually a really quick way we can do this. And that is, why don't we go ahead and grab all of our dynamic objects, the dynamic you know, geometry here. And I'm going to go to MoGraph and I'm create a tracer object. So cool. Now we got a tracer. And actually, that didn't work. It didn't put all the children in like I thought it would. So instead, I'm going to lock it down delete the base and now let's just manually drag these in because I locked it you see it's still here and now I can drag these all in boom okay and now that, that worked I can unlock it so that I always forget to unlock it so we'll just do that now I can go back into my tracer if I were to hit play right now uh, that's totally not what we want so what we do want to do is not trace the vertices because now it's tracing every point so now hit play now it's tracing every object still not what we want what we want to do is connect all objects I think so let's rewind and hit play and cool that looks like it's doing something so we can't see it very well, but if I were to hide all of our geometry, I now have a, I now have a spline that's perfectly running along that. So awesome, that is working. That's exactly what I want that to do. And I probably want to move the tracer below this, so that just the tracer has an order of operations calculation issue sometimes. And I, I if we we want to calculate later, so we'll put it after. So we've got this wind. And I want the wind to be traveling up this line. And not only do I want it to be traveling up the line, when it gets to the end, I want it to jump back down to the beginning. Now, you might be able to do that in... Well, so how would I do that by default? Well, I'm going to right-click, and I'm going to add a Cinema 4D Align the Spline tag, and the spline will be the tracer. And now we have a control on here that I can just drag this and pull it up, and you'll see it'll travel up the line. Perfect. It's working exactly the way we want it to. Now we need to animate that. Now, um, I'll, I, let's go ahead and try and do this manually, and I'll show you. And, but then we're going to use Signal, uh, Grayscale Gorilla Signal, and there's a very good reason why. So I'm going to go ahead and record a keyframe here, and let's go forward 100 keyframes, let's say. Or actually, let's jump to about 50, and I'll say, you go up to 100 now. So I'm going to record that. So what we could do, I 
think, um, well, first of all, these are spline-based. I want it to be linear, so I can just say linear. So now if I were to hit play, you see it's going to travel up. And you see it's going to jump around because it's following the spline, which is dynamically changing. But it's going to travel up, and now it's kind of stuck on the end here. So, okay, that's working fine. But I want to, I want to loop. It should do that over and over and over again. So we can go to our timeline. So I'm going to go to window mm, timeline dope sheet. And now you see we have this align the spline and we have some keyframes. So I can actually, uh, actually, I'm not even, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy. There is a way of looping these. Oh, if we go to position and now we've got that, I can grab those, but there's no looping here. There's a way of like converting this to motion and then telling it to loop. But uh, I'm actually, I was gonna, I was gonna show you, but I can't even think of what it is right now. So instead, uh, I don't want to do that way anyway. I want to use signals. So I'm gonna delete all the keyframes. I just deleted it from the timeline. It's got no keyframes. It's just at zero. Cool. Now I'm gonna use Grayscale Grill's plugin Signal, and this is a perfect application for Signal. I'm gonna go and create Signal. And what do we want Signal to control? I want to control the position. So I'm gonna drop that onto here. So it's animating that parameter. So now I'm gonna say I want this to go from zero to 100. And I, I want it to go from zero, let's say the 45 frames. So it's going to take that long to do one to the other. And I actually want to animate. So I'm going to right click and say linear. So it's going to go hit the end. So now if I go and hit play, and of course our spine is going to fall. But if I hit play, you see it travels to the end and it did the exact same thing our keyframe was doing. But now in signal, I can just say loop. And now it will do that over and over again. It's going to, you see it's traveling down the line, gets to the end, travels down the line, gets to the end, travels down the line. Perfect. So this is all working really well. We have this fall off wind traveling where our dynamics are going. So you see it's traveling along, but the wind isn't strong enough. So let's go back to our wind and tell it to be, I don't know, three times as strong, 155. And now, okay, we have a stronger wind, but it's, and you see it's actually doing a pretty good job of pulling it up. And uh, I, I think we're probably gonna wanna go stronger, but you see it's actually whipping around quite a bit. There's a lot of motion happening. I want to slow that all down. Now, there are some settings inside of Dynamics we, we could use, but the settings end up going very high. Like, we have to crank them to, to ridiculous numbers. So something I found works really well is going to our Simulate menu, Particles, and using Friction. Friction is working great in this situation. So I create a Friction, immediately it's getting applied, and you see immediately it slowed everything down. Um, so now, it's like everything's not happening as crazy, and now look at this wind. If we were to hide the wind, because it's very visually distracting, if I hide that, Look at this. It feels like we get this wave traveling upward through it, constantly refreshing it. And that's exactly what we want. We want to get this vibe of the wind originating from the bottom and then blowing up to the top. And what's great is our wind is traveling up this, but we're not telling it to rotate. So it's always saying blow straight up in the air, straight up in the air. And now it's fairly powerful. So it's blowing up. Uh, looks, looks good. We can try and make it stronger. Let's say 255. Ooh, that looks a little better. I like that a little more. So it's blowing up, blowing up. It keeps forcing it to straighten out. Uh, with a stronger wind, I feel like we can maybe add a little more turbulence. Let's try one, one, one. Let's get that little more waviness going. Yeah, look at that overlapping. It's looking really good. And you see that friction, oh, we only have that set to 10. That's a very nice, clean, low number. So it's very easy to make changes on that. If we were to crank this up to, say, 100, you see super slow motion. If we drop it down to, like, 5, everything's going to be a little bit quicker. So now we have almost this, this very simple control here to be like, how much should this be whipping around? And I actually do kind of like it whipping around this a little extra bit. But just to keep things clean, let's set it back to 10. A little bit more slow motion. Looking good. I like this a lot. It's working really well. Let's rewind and go ahead and save it to num file number 3 and be able to continue from here. Now, uh, I just know for a fact that at the end of this, we're going to want to copy and paste this guy a couple times. And what that means is we don't want there to be multiple frictions. We don't want there to be multiple wins. These should each be unique to one wacky, wavy, inflatable tube man. So what we need to do is the dynamics right here that we have by default, the forces are excluding things, which means it's excluding nothing, which means everything's applying all the time. That's not what we want. We want to include only certain things do we want to include. We want to include the turbulence. We want to include the wind and we want to include the friction. Now, effectively nothing changed, but that means we can copy and paste this rig multiple times and it won't break. These winds, these you know, these particle effectors here are part of the rig now. They're not kind of universal. So good, good little start there. Now, uh, what is actually the next step here? We gotta, we gotta think about this. Well, 
Uh, actually, this is all working. This is all working so well that I think we might already be at the step where we can start adding in the arms. So we're going to do that at time of zero. Always make your changes at zero. Um, so what are we going to do here? Well, we've already got a very nice rig here. In fact, all of this stuff is working really well. So I want to use it again. And in fact, the arms are going to behave in an almost identical way. It should behave just like this rig, except instead of the wind blowing up, when the wind, and look at these images, when the wind gets to around the torso, the wind would then blow out the arms. So pretty much the wind would be traveling, but blow out to the side. So, okay, cool. That means pretty much exactly what we have here is what we need everywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the tracer and the dynamic body and the wind, copy and paste. So now we've got the whole setup again. So now we can go ahead and grab, maybe uh, I'm going to grab all of the dynamic arm. The, all of this rig here, and I'm going to rename it. I'm going to go into, maybe it's not under there. Maybe it's under uh, tools. Oh, it is. Uh, it, it, it used to be under character tool, and then they took it out. So we have a naming tool. And I'm just going to say I want to replace uh, D-Y-N, you know, dynamic object, with arm1. Replace name. Cool. So now these are all arm1. Just a way of distinguishing it. So cool. Looking good, looking good. Now, all we have to do is actually move this arm. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the arm, and I'm going to hit R for rotate, and let's spin it off 90 degrees here. Hit E for move, and I'm just going to eyeball this. I'm going to move this up to one of the upper areas, maybe right around there. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Now, I want to make sure that we're not intersecting. We don't want the dynamics hitting each other. So that's right there. It's going to be off to the side a little bit like that. Looking good. And let's, let's take a look uh, how high the arm should be. This seems about right. That seems about right. Uh, and we don't need them to be nearly as long. So we can go down here to, nope, 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 maybe there. So I'm going to go down to number 12 and hit delete. And just based on the way we rigged everything, that should, oh, and so now we've got this one final arm with one final connector. And that one's not actually doing anything. So we turned that one off. So cool. Now we've got a separate arm with all the connectors. And because we built the hierarchy in a very clean way, that should have uh, that should be working perfectly. Now, of course, this is completely separate right now. You see, it's just connected right there. So that's not doing anything terribly interesting. Uh, but before we go and connect on the body, why don't we go ahead and figure out this wind first? So uh, we've got the wind, and it's actually traveling uh, theoretically. And because we copy and pasted this arm, um, you see that we now it still has a friction and it has wind. Did I copy and paste or drag and drop? I'm not sure. But you see it has a turbulence, which is good. I want that. And it has wind, and it does, it does indeed have wind one, which is the copy and pasted one. And it still has a, the universal friction. So copy and pasting works great here. But our wind is still blowing upward, and that's no good on this one. Um, oh, did the tracer not update? No, the tracer also updated. Uh, I'm just not sure. Oh, the wind is up here. I just clicked the wrong object. So the only thing that's wrong with this is the wind is telling it to blow up. So now we can just grab the wind and rotate it 90 degrees here. So now it's blowing off the side. I get play. Now you can see the wind is traveling along the arm. It's trying to keep it straight. So, okay, that's already working great. Um, so let's see, what are some other things we might want to do? Well, I think we want to make them a little bit skinnier. This arm is a little fat right now. So I'm just going to grab all of the geometry, go to polygon, select all, and hit T for scale. And now I think we can actually just grab this red band. So for me, it'll be on green and blue. I can grab those and start scaling. And it's going to scale them uniformly. It's scaling these uniformly. and uh, But it's not changing the length. So that's looking really good right there. I made it. It's just a little bit, a little bit taller than the arm. I don't think that'll mess us up. But we'll just have to see. Um, cool. So now that's the arm scaled down. And now we need to make it part of the hierarchy. So where, what should this be parented to? Well, um, we've already got all these really nice connectors. Now, what I'm thinking is why don't we just go ahead and make this top arm dynamic? We can make this top arm dynamic so it'll start falling away. Why don't we just do that to start? I'm going to save, grab this, and let's say go ahead and instead of being dynamic off, so it just stays in one place, let's go ahead and say it's on. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and just say play, and now view, it's going to blow away because of the wind. So now it's a dynamic object. So now we need to connect it. Well, it needs to connect to this piece of geometry. And this is number 25 you see right there. So what I can do is uh, I'm going to actually collapse down everything from the base, and we've got this top connector, and that's connecting to the child. What I'm, going to, what I'm going to do is duplicate this connector, and I'm going to rename it fixed. Oops, I missed. Fixed. So that's a fixed connector now. 
and I want this to be a fixed connection. And what do I want to connect? Well, it's already ARM base one, and I want it to be on, and I wonder if we can do this in the viewport. I don't even know. <gasps> we can, this is awesome. I can click that, and now you can see we are linked to dynamic, uh, you know, the main chain dynamic 25. So this has is now a fixed connection to that, which means wherever this goes, this has to go. So let's go ahead and hit play and see what happens. Oh, look at that. It is now connected. Now you see that this, this new wind is pulling this whole thing off to the side, uh, which makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's totally connected now. Uh, so all that worked great. Uh, let's go ahead and copy this uh, onto the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I need to grab the arm, the tracer, and the wind. Copy, paste. And let's just position this correctly. Once again, all we need to do is worry about the arm. So we can just say negative 90, which is going to flip it to the, the other side. And we can just say negative, for me, what is 30, negative X, apply. And now you see it's perfectly mirrored on the other side. It's all just dynamic, so we don't have to get more specific than that. The tracer, because we copy and pasted, will automatically link to the new arm. And the wind will automatically be linked to the new arm. Uh, we can go and rename it uh, if we wanted to. I don't think it's terribly important. Uh, and the only thing we have to do is fix the wind, because right now the wind is still blowing uh, to the right. So now we can spin this over to the other direction. Cool. So now we hit play, and now those two winds should pretty much cancel, cancel each other out, and now it's just blowing up into the air. Uh, so that's actually working really well. Now something I do want to change a little bit here is right now we're just kind of guessing that the wind should always turn right and left, but I don't know that that's true. I think that, and we're just getting a little bit nitty-gritty, but... The wind, like if the body twisted a little bit, then the wind should be able to twist too. But right now it's always going to be pushing left and right. So it's always going to kind of straighten them out. So what we actually want this wind to do is be facing kind of the equivalent orientation of this part of the torso. So if this was twisted, uh, you know, if this was twisted that much that way, we would want the wind to blow that direction as well. Because that's where the, the hole is and it's going to blow it out that way. So... Uh, this, I think, is pretty straightforward. We've got our wind, and right now it doesn't care about rotation. It's not changing ever. So we can just right-click and add a Cinema 4D character tag, constraint, and what do I want this to do? I want it to be a PSR, my favorite one. Turn on PSR, and I don't care about position. I only care about rotation. So I'm going to go ahead and unhide this wind so we can see it. And you can see this one's blowing out that way. So what should this be linked to? Well, we already said this part of the torso, so why don't we go ahead and link to... I don't know if I'll be able to hit it. There we go. That one. And now it's linked to that. But you'll see right away that our wind is now facing backward. And that's because that's the orientation of that. And it'll always kind of rotate the same way, even though there's a completely separate hierarchy. But now we need to offset it. So I can just grab the constraint tag. We've got our uh, offset right here. And so we can just find the correct rotation, which was the top one. I can say 90 degrees. And now you'll see that it's actually facing the right direction. But that is relative to this. And you'll see if I were to grab that piece and rotate it, our wind is also rotating. Cool, working perfectly. I can copy this tag to this other wind. Boom. And now this wind is... Oh, and I, now it's rotated. Uh, it's snapped instantly to the same thing. But we do want the same thing, except instead of being 90, it should be negative 90. So now it's facing out that way. Uh, awesome. So that should all be working. Now if the torso rotates, the winds should also rotate. And let's go ahead and give this a quick save. Number four. Let's hit play and see what we got. Okay, not too bad. He's waving around. Now, these arms seem a little stiff. And I think that's because this chain isn't so long that you'll see that our wind is almost catching it all the time. It's too big. So I can grab both of those winds, and I'm going to go to the fall-off, changing both of them simultaneously. And I'll set the, the scale instead of 200. Let's go back to 100 so they get tinier. Oh, look at that. Right away, we're getting some, some more floppiness happening. And even though it's constantly blowing and trying to straighten it out a bit, there's a little bit more floppiness. Very nice. Now, another thing that we might want to do on here is grab, oh, and I didn't even think about this, but um, our, our upper one, I guess, I guess it's fine, but we want to go and grab the two dynamic tags that are on our arms. Now, not the base, it should be the first one, because this is the one that filters down to all the others. We have the ones that filter down to all the others, and maybe even the base one, so we'll grab all of them. And right now, those arms are pretty heavy, and I think they should be a lot lighter as compared to the body. So what I'm going to do is go to our mass, and we have a world density, and I'm going to say custom density, and why don't we say like 0.2? So they're a lot lighter now, so the body is going to have a lot more sway over what happens to these arms. 
And that seems to be working quite well. Like now we have three different winds that are doing most of our dynamic animation. We've got this perfect dynamic chain. It's running super quick in the viewport. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and hide this final, or I'm going to hide this wind because it's distracting. And we've got, you know, a, you know, while there's a lot of items, we have a very clean hierarchy. This is all very under control. We have a, a very nice, simple, I think fairly simple, robust looking rig. Now, actually, there's one thing I want to do here, and here's where Signal's going to help out some more, is these arms are always like traveling out over and over again. But if you think about it, like as this big wave travels up, I think that's right when those should shoot out. So actually, let's go ahead and unhide our three winds. And you'll see that as I frame forward, those immediately start traveling outward. It's, it's not lined up when this one gets there. So why don't we keep framing forward until the frame in which that boom gets there. See, that's right there. And I feel like maybe even one frame prior, this is where that wind should start blowing out. So we can go back to these children and I'm going to grab the two children signal tags. Oh, did I not copy the... Uh... I might not have copied this. Oh, wait. Oh, oh I did. It's just on the end. The, they're out of order. So I'm going to make sure that's in the beginning just so that these all line up properly. I grab signal and signal. And you, we see that this is happening too soon. It's happening 36 frames too soon. So in signal, I can just say, you know what? Wait. I'm going to offset it by 36 frames. Boom. Now at 36 frames, the winds are offset into the center point. So now when it plays through... You see those will travel up, and now those will fly off to the end. And then they'll travel through, fly off to the end, travel through, fly off to the end. So now it's lined up. It's kind of got that same that same pattern as the arm does, or as the body does. So it's just a, it's a tiny thing, but like now those are, uh, those are synced up a little bit better. Okay, quite happy with that. The winds are visually in the way again. I'm going to hide them. We're going to be doing probably a lot of that. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's see. Is there anything else? Is there anything else specifically to do on this guy? He's working really well. Uh, I'm quite happy with it. So why don't we go ahead and uh, wrap up this part one? Because the next one we're going to move on to uh, linking this to a mesh and maybe doing some extra fancy stuff on the end. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Hi there, everybody. Chris Schmidt back with part two of our wacky waving inflatable tube man. So uh, we are now going to be dealing with making a mesh for this guy and then binding it to it. So uh, how are we going to do that? Well, uh, I think we actually have a, a nice little advantage here in the fact that we have three tracers that are already perfectly tracing our geometry, our, our different uh, model bits. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to copy and paste those and then make them editable. So now uh, with any luck, Let's make sure. I'm going to pull this off the side. And you see, boom, I've got a line. And not only do I have a line, there should be a point right at the center of each of those. So what I'm going to do is actually, why don't I go ahead and create a null? And I'm going to grab everything else we have except for those three new splines and put it into the null. And that we can just collapse and hide. In fact, we are going to hide it. So now you see, we just get these. Excellent. So. What do we want to do? Well, we want to sweep it, of course. So I'm going to create a sweep. I'm going to create an inside. I'm going to drop the inside in the sweep, and let's grab the first one and drop it in. Super fat, but okay, it's all good. Let's hit T for scale and start scaling down. In fact, we do want these to match pretty well. So I'll unhide that. Now I'm going to scale this until it's maybe a hair bigger, but not too much bigger. And I'm going to I'm going to be um. Let's rename this null dynamics. And I'm going to be turning this on and off constantly. Let's go to our end side and set it up to eight sides. So now we get this nice even amount of eight looking good. And now, okay, I'm going to say sweep caps, none, none, nice. And now let's go ahead and copy and paste it. And instead of using that spline, I'm going to delete that tracer and throw in this one, number five, looking good. Uh, I want to scale down T for scale. Scale down this end side until it's just about the size of that arm. Looking good. And now we can copy and paste that one. Delete out that spline and put our final spline in. Boom. And now we've got sweep, sweep, sweep and our original mesh. Now you will see that's cop. It's the little tip of the head's not quite going through and the arms aren't quite going through because of course it's going to the middle of that model. We could extend the mesh out to those end points, but I actually think it's fine. Uh, our middle one, actually, our original one is still halfway through the ground dynamics wise. It's static, so it doesn't matter, but that actually does place that one perfectly. Uh, I, I'm actually completely fine with that. Uh, there'll be that little bit, bit of extra overlap there, but let's let's go ahead and leave that. 
Oh, okay, cool. So hide the original dynamics. And now we've got these three sweeps. Now, uh, you never know if you're going to go back to these. So I'm going to actually copy and paste them, copy, paste. And I'm going to grab the three original ones, hit Alt, G, and then hide. And now there's three like hidden meshes there. Because now I'm going to grab all three of these and I'm going to create a connect object. Why don't we just create a connect object? I'm going to grab sweep, 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 put it inside the connect and make it editable. Boom. They're all one model. So what do we do now? Well, <laughs> excuse me. Um, well, I want to connect these arms, obviously, to the body. So why don't we go ahead and do that? I'm going to go ahead and hit MD, which is close polygon hole. And I'm going to say close that hole. Boom. Close this hole. Boom. MD. There's a shortcut. So now I can go ahead and grab that polygon. I can grab that polygon. And then I can grab these four. Very carefully, you see those four. I can go ahead and grab these four. Oop, uh, that one right there. Not this one. So what we should have is four on the side, four on the side, that one, that one. So what's great about this is I think that we should be... Oh, 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 I almost missed a step. Uh, I'm going to grab this, just these two ends, hit D for extrude. And I'm going to extrude this in about half the distance. And now based on that, now I'm going to grab those inside ones. So I'll grab these, grab these, grab that, grab that. Pretty much the same thing, except, you know, we got that little edge right there. Uh, so now what's cool is I can hit the letter B for bridge, and I want to bridge between this polygon and this cluster of polygons. So I can just say, I want to bridge from there to there. Bink! Automatically linked. Grab from here to here. Bink! Automatically linked. That tool works great. And uh, the way we model this is all these polygons are perfectly lining up, so we still have quads everywhere. Very clean. Now what I might do is we could grab this loop. I'm going to go to edge tool, edge mode, you will grab this loop. Grab this loop, hit T. I could maybe scale these in a little bit, but I'm not going to go too far because there would be that little bit of, of kind of mesh transition, even if you're physically sewing it in real life. So that's actually a pretty nice little transition there. Uh, and now we have one clean mesh looking pretty good. Two or, well, I'm sure there's a bunch more things, but let's go ahead and do a couple more things. If we were to look at our, oops, sorry, uh, that was the other recording. If we go and look at one of these, you'll see that our little guy here, uh, his, uh, his geometry curves inward and then there's an open hole right there on the edge. So it kind of like constricts it a little bit. And I think that actually helps and keep him inflated a little bit. Um, so we definitely want to incorporate that into this. And I, I think we want to do it on the head and on the arms. Let's just do the head. So I'm, gonna, I'm on my edge tool and hit UL. Let's grab this loop and hit the letter D for extrude. Now, if I click and drag, I can start pulling up, which is great. Now, I only, I only want to go a little bit, but something that's cool is if we, without letting go, if I hold down the shift key, I can actually change my orientation. So we can actually go ahead and pull that in a little bit. And I, do we want to go flat? I mean, you can go flat, maybe not quite flat. Um, we are going to be throwing a subdivision surface on here. So I'll, maybe I'll just go ahead and do that. So now you see we've got that. Maybe I want to go a little smaller, T for scale, scale it down. Cool. Same thing on the ends of the hands. Grab that loop. Grab that loop, and we should, can do them simultaneously. D, drag out, and actually remember the settings we had, so it should already extrude inward. And we're going to get that sharpened up a little bit like that. Cool. So now we've got that extra bit of geometry here. Working great. Very, very happy with this. Now, um, I'm trying to think if we should do this on this step or not. I guess not. Let's not worry about that yet. Now, uh, so now we've got a mesh. Let's go ahead and, you know what, I don't think we're going to need to go back to those uh, sweeps. So I'm going to delete them. So we've got our dynamics and now we've got our mesh. So let's go even head, go ahead and call that mesh. And now why don't we just go ahead and bind this? Let's weld our stuff onto him. Now we've done this kind of stuff in the past with joints, but here's something that's pretty cool. And I actually had forgotten you could do this. What I want to do is grab all of the arms. Uh, I want to grab the arms, the arm, and then all of this, pretty much all of the geometry. So, uh, no, uh, I can't think of any, it, uh, there are some quicker ways, like, um, I want to grab these as quickly as possible. I guess this is a tutorial, so we want to be educating, learning things. So, you know what I can actually do? I can go ahead and go to this little eyeball up here, and I can say, show me eyeball. And now I'm going to go over here, and uh, it is telling us that we have 60 polygon objects. I think if we double click on that polygon object, it's actually going to automatically select all the polygon objects. So that was actually quicker than I thought it would be. So we've now selected every polygon object. And because of the way we have the scene and because it's isolated and this is all we have, that's actually exactly what we want to have selected. 
which is the mesh and then all of the dynamic bits. So perfect, exactly what I wanted. So now what I want to do is go to character, uh, character commands bind. So uh, I'm gonna click bind and I want to point something out that's very, very interesting and important here. What we just did is we just bound this character or all these dynamic parts to the mesh as if they were joints, but they're not joints. So uh, it just automatically created a weight tag. It also created a skin deformer, which allows that to bend. And I don't know for sure, but I think we might be able to just hit play. And look at that. All we did was click play, and now we are already bound. And now he's blown around. Uh, we already bound the mesh that easily, so pretty cool. So uh, now you'll see when I hit play that, like, this is looking good. It's, you know, it's all moving. But you will see that we're starting to get some weird twisting going on in here. Uh, and that is because our, our, the way the uh, cardan, the connector, is, is affecting it, it can still twist around in some weird angles. Now, we couldn't see it before when, it, those, when it's just those objects, but we can see it now that it's translating to the mesh. So how can we fix that? Well, uh, we're going to have to go into all those dynamics tags we set up. So I'm going to collapse the arm down, not to the base, but to one down. Not the base, but one down. Not the base, but one down. Because we have this dynamic tag, this one, and this one. There are a couple settings I want to throw in here. First of all, I want to put a little bit of angular dampening in here. So I'm going to throw in 99% angular dampening, which should slow all of those down. They're not going to rotate quite so quick. And then I want to add in, I think, uh, a bunch of follow rotation. So I'm going to say 100 follow 100 follow rotation and now that i've done that it's always trying to get back to its original rotation it doesn't have to be there and the wind can twist it around but immediately you see that it straightened out those kinks now we will occasionally still get those kinks and if we crank this up higher and higher i think we could fight it more and more but i actually don't mind them being in there a tiny little bit and this will always be re-straightening them out it works incredibly well so you see we've got this mesh it's waving around in the wind uh and now like we have all the dynamics but those are driving this actual mesh working great now we can go ahead and create a subdivision surface let's throw our mesh in there it's going to smooth it all out we can maybe hide our polygon so we just see the smoothness and that's looking pretty dang good uh all dynamic uh we're not doing any well i mean i guess the wind's got keyframes but you know um you know all, all dynamically driven um uh, now a uh, couple things we might want to do um we probably want to smooth out the way the the well, I, I was going to say joints, but we don't have joints. But the way that this is this is deforming based on the dynamic objects, let's we'll move that out a little bit. Now, something very very important to note. In fact, why don't we do it wrong before we do it right? Is I'm, I'm going to grab the mesh and let's grab the tag. And you can see we have all these different objects. Now, unfortunately, we can't use the tool here. We have to go to Character Manager Weights Manager. And now this is something that's pretty cool. But you'll see as I click on these different parts, we're not see how we got like a selection there, but we're not really seeing it. That's because it won't see through the uh, subdivision surface. We can hit the letter Q and that will actually turn off the subdivision surface. And now as I click through all of these different parts, we can actually see where these are connected. So if I click on the top there, all, you're seeing all of them. I can go and grab all these children, hold down shift, grab the bottom. Now you can see here is how the different parts are bound onto the body. And all I want to do is smooth this out a little bit. So all I'm going to do is say 100% strength in Weights Manager. I don't want the mode to be add. I want the mode to be smooth. And I'm going to say apply all. And look, instantly it smoothed it out. In my test, I did it twice and it looked pretty good. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do it twice. So we did two layers of smoothing. And now I can just deselect it, get out of that tool. Now we're back here. We can go back to subdivision here, hit play. And all that should do is just blend between the different dynamic bits a little bit. It's just smooth out the overall surface a little bit. Just make it a little nicer. And look at that. We've got our wacky waving. A uh, guy working quite well, looking very, very nice. Um, and you see that little pinch right there? And like I said, if we crank up our our angular dampening, we might be able to fix that, uh, stop that from happening more. I'm going to leave it here because it's not bothering me too much. Uh, okay, now now what are some other things we want to do? Well, um, there's a couple there's a couple different uh, aspects I want to tinker around on this guy. I'm trying to think of, think of what the first one would be. Firstly, why don't we give him some wrinkles? Why don't we have it wrinkle where he bends? And I'm not even sure to what degree that happens in the real ones. Yeah, yeah, you can see there's like wrinkles happening here. And uh, yeah, definitely, you see here where they start pinching, you get these nice bends. So why don't we get a little bit of that going on in this? So how do we get that working? Well, I'm going to turn off our subdivision surface for a second so we can just see our mesh. And I'm going to right-click, and I'm going to give it a character tag. And the tag will be 
tension. Boom, we've got tension tag. So what does tension tag do? Well, tension tag drives a vertex weight. So we need one. So I'm going to say, this is a fold map. So I'm going to say, make a map. Boom, it made a vertex weight and it automatically applied it. It's called folds. Cool. Now I do want to see my controls here, but I want to see what the vertex map is showing me. So what I'm going to do is click my tension tag, lock it, and then click on my vertex tag. So we're seeing in the viewport what the vertex does, but we actually still have our controls of the folds. So if I did play right now, I don't think we're really going to see anything. And that's because at the time of zero, we need to say fix tension. So we just fixed the tension and saying, this is default. And now we can hit play and boom, instantly you're going to see a whole bunch of uh, colors happening. And what's happening here is wherever the mesh is pinching a little bit, wherever it's compressing, we are now giving it 100% weight. Now what's cool here is we can actually go to our amount and we can start pulling this up a little bit because I want to be a little bit smoother with this. I don't want them to peak so much. So now I pulled it up to, uh, for me, it's about seven. I'm eyeballing it. And we could go, you know, over here, it is happening, but it's very light. And then here you can see a little bit more. For me, the number that looks pretty good, because this is blown out, like when you're at this tiny amount. So for me, about six or seven is looking really nice. Um, where we actually have some tension traveling through here. Because, oh, cool, now we've got a tension tag. Uh, let's go ahead and create a material. And let's jump into the material. And to start out with, why don't we... Uh, I want to get some wrinkly stripes going. So how would we get some wrinkly stripes going? Well, if I were to turn on our luminous channel, turn off the color, and let's go ahead and apply this. Apply it to the mesh. I'm going to go ahead and make a new 2D material. I'm going to say noise. And inside of noise, I'm going to say you're not based on a texture. You're based on UV2, UV2D. Pretty much what this is is a JPEG now. It's a procedurally generated 2D image. It's not a cloud of noise. It's an image. So uh, I already know the settings I kind of want, which is going to be uh, about 150. And I want these to be stretched out lines horizontally. Like I want these little stripes around him. So I'm going to set this down to maybe 20. So now you see we, these are stretched. But... Um, it's not, it's not looking quite good enough here. And you'll actually see that we should get a seam like right there. You see, we have a seam. I don't want the seam. The best way to get rid of the seam is to make it infinite on the left and right. So if I were to set a relative scale to zero, it just turns into long stripes. So now you can see right away. And if I hit render, you'll see even better. Actually, I guess the 155 is too much. I'm going to drop it back down to 100 and maybe even crank our contrast up a little bit. Now you can see we get all these really nice horizontal stripes. So yeah, working quite well. We got some nice kind of wrinkle, you know, the idea of some wrinkles. And then because of the way we built this with sweeps, you see we're automatically getting these, these horizontal wrinkles, which is actually quite good as well. The only problem is that it's messing up in the new geometry we made. So we need to fix that. So I'm going to rewind this to zero and let's fix that. So we're actually going to have to do a little bit of UVing. What's great, is th uh, what's great about this tutorial is that we're actually tackling a whole bunch of tiny things that do happen these are all things you have to deal with 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 a character but we're making a very simple character uh anyway we need to need to do with our <clears throat> we need to deal with our uvs so i'm going to jump into a different layout only time i ever change my layout is go to body paint uv edit boom so now we're dealing with the uvs now uh you might not see this tag right here and if you don't grab your uv tag which is this little gridded one here and you drag it and drop it right there and boom you should see this mesh so all of this is actually working quite well right now, um, except for that bit. So uh, I think the best way to fix this actually is going to be just to remap this entirely. So what I'm going to do is uh, grab this polygon tool and hit UL, and I'm going to grab that loop and that loop. And then I'm going to say UF for uh, fill, and I'm going to fill my inner selection. So what I've done is grabbed all those polygons, and we've got that. Now, based on the orientation that we're at right now, I'm pretty sure that if we go down to projection, I can hit cylindrical and it's just going to automatically work. That one automatically works. It should work for you as well because it's a cylinder going up and down. Perfect. Now you'll see it fixed half of it, but not the other half. So to fix the other half, all we have to do is hit, we have to invert our current selection, which is U, I, invert. Now we've inverted and we've grabbed everything else. Now, if we hit cylinder now, not working. Now we've got these horizontal stripes, and that's because this is not a vertical tube. I'm going to hit undo, and we have to do this a little bit differently this time. Uh, it's a little more complicated. So 
Uh, right now we're on normal polygons, but I actually want to go on to our UV polygons. Otherwise, this won't work. So I'm going to actually, and let me show you. We're going to go do interactive mapping, but you see it's grayed out. That's because we're in regular polygons, not UV polygons. So I just click onto the other one. It will automatically, no shift or anything, it automatically converts from the current selection to UV selection. So now we've got those selected. And you see now we do have start interactive mapping. So I can hit start interactive mapping. Boom. And now you'll see right away that what happens is we now have a cylinder in our view and we now have control over that. I can now use my, I can grab this and move it up and down. Uh, I can, I should be able to pull it left and right. If we had the axis tool turned on, which I don't know, it might be a little hard to do that. But the point being is already, I think at default, it's already doing a good job. So we can just say that is indeed kind of the mapping that we want it to have. And I can just go ahead and say stop interactive mapping and boom now we've got a cylinder that travels horizontally uh, otherwise you would have had to have rotated it and stretched it and done all those things but now we've got these stretched around in different ways and now we've got our stripes working the way we want to so i can jump back to standard and now if i were to maybe even deselect off my polygons you see we get this one hard edge there but i i'm completely fine with that now we've got nice clean uvs with stripes everywhere exactly what, what we want and kind of the scale we want Maybe I want these scaled a little bit better horizontally, and we could even do that. Why don't, why don't we just go ahead and throw that in, because we've already been talking about all this. Uh, if I go back to polygons, I still have those selected, so I can invert that UI. Oop, uh, I have to have my mesh selected. UI, it inverts that, and now I can hit T for scale. Uh, actually, no, I can't hit T. I have to... Oh, can I hit T? All right, I can, but I have to make sure I'm in this window. No. T, T, T. Um, scale. Oh, I have to be in UVs. What am I talking about? Click on UVs, and I'd st we can't. Oh, okay, we can scale in the viewport, but I, do, I want to scale over here. So if we start scaling up or down, you're going to see we're going to get more or less of them, and I'm completely fine with just going bigger than our normal UV map. So I can just go bigger until these stripes are about the same scale as the ones on the arm, and now it's matching. Cool, exactly what I wanted. So now we can go back to standard, and I just want to make sure I'm back on regular modes so we're not on a tool we don't want to be. Cool. So now we've got this guy all mapped around, looking good. Let's go back to dealing with our uh, sub-poly stuff. So, so what was the thing we did? And sorry, I, I wish I had done this part before we did the tension map. But now we're going back to the tension map. So now we've got this stripe. It's mapped the way we want to. We already know that. So why don't we go ahead and... Uh, actually, why don't we build it here? Because we're going to put it into displacement, but I always kind of like doing it inside of luminance so we can see what we're doing. So we've got this noise inside the luminance. Why don't we go ahead and turn this into a layer shader? So I'm going to say a layer shader. And now inside the layer shader, I want to bring in the vertex map. We do that by going to shader, effects, vertex map. And now we have a vertex map. I can drag in my vertex map, which is this one called folds. And now... Uh, we need to combine these in some way. And what I found is the best way is these are going to pull push in and out. And I, I do want that. Uh, but everything else where there isn't a fold shouldn't do anything. So if we're pushing in and out, not doing anything means 50% gray. So I can make a color shader. And the color in the color shader should be 50% gray. And now the vertex map can be a mask. Where the tag shows, it should show, and where it's you know where it's yellow, it should show, and where it's red, it shouldn't. So the stripe should be there in some spots and not in others. So if I hit, actually, if we hit render, we'll just see stripes everywhere. But if I hit play and we actually get some bends in it, I should be able to hit render. And let me stop the uh, mesh from rendering. And what are we seeing? Well, it doesn't really seem to be doing much, and that's because the uh, order of these is backwards. So I'm actually going to flip the color and the noise to the other end. So noise is above, this below. We could have also inverted our map, but I think that works. Let's go ahead and hit render, and there we go. Look at that. Now that we invert it, we can actually see what we got. And now where it's bending, where it's compress compressing, we are seeing a little hint of these stripes coming in. Awesome. That's exactly what we want. So now we can go ahead and grab this luminance channel, and I'm going to drag it into our displacement channel. We actually don't want the luminance anymore, and we want to turn the color back on. So now we can go into displacement, turn it on, uh, I'm actually going to leave the height at the default of 5, and let's turn on sub-poly displacement and round geometry. Let's just go ahead and hit render, and see what we get. Oh my goodness, look at that. Uh, working great. We now have wrinkles where this is compressing. 
Now, uh, now stylistically, you decide what you want to, how you want to look. Like, is that in and out too far? Uh, actually, let's see if the round contour is doing us any favors. Yeah, it doesn't really seem to make much difference. Um, so, uh, like, you can, you know, I can go further in here. This would be too much, but now we can crank these wrinkles up so they're really big. We can go smaller. I actually kind of like the default of five for the scale I happen to be working at. That's looking pretty good. And now we can go inside of our noise and we can decide if those should be bigger or smaller. So now we've got our global scale. I'd be like, you know what? I want this to be twice as big. And now you see we get softer wrinkles that aren't quite so tight. Or you'd be like, you know what? I want them to be tiny, tight little wrinkles. And now you can drop it down to, you know, 50. And now these are all that size. So it's all about deciding what scale you want. Uh, I think maybe 125. Yeah, just a little bigger than default is looking pretty good for me. Rounding that all out. Now we are subdividing this quite a bit via our sub poly, which means I don't think we need our subdivision surface anymore, especially since we're doing round geometry. Not 100% sure on that, but uh, I'm going to leave that turned off for a little while. So now we shall automatically get, be getting that compression. Of course, we won't see in the viewport, but whenever we hit render, we should see them. And it, what's cool is that's always going to be animating and moving around. So wherever the compression is, that's where the folds are going to show up. So awesome. We're getting our wrinkles in there. Looking pretty good. So uh, let's see what uh, I think we might want to start getting a little. Well, I still want to work on the rig before we worry about lighting or anything. But why don't we make this guy a more interesting color? Let's make him a nice orange, nice bright orange. So cool. Now we got a nice bright orange one. What do we need now? I think we need a face on this guy. We need to make some sort of face. So you know what? I'm going to start. Uh, hmm, actually, uh, I'm just quicker at doing stuff in, in cinema. So why don't we make a face in cinema in a separate file? And we'll just save it as an, out as an image. So uh, I, I don't even know. I'm making this up as I go. So why don't we go ahead and make a nice circle. And I will put, I'll create a symmetry object. And let's put the symmetry, put this circle in the symmetry. And we'll put the circle into a loft. And maybe we can even, I'm going to group that, Alt G, group that, make another loft. I'll pull this one forward a little bit, T for scale, scale it down. That becomes the pupil. Uh, I can grab this. Grab both of these, pull them off the side. Now we'll have two. Let's go ahead and make some nice materials. And by nice, I mean the simplest things ever. Get that white. Let's go ahead and make black. Throw that on here. And now we can maybe, ooh, and I probably want to go ahead and turn off our reflectance on those so we're not seeing any highlights. And now let's go ahead and maybe make an eyebrow. I'll just make a cube for that. Whoops. Pull that over here, make it a little bigger. Let's throw that into the null in the symmetry. You don't get, uh, stuff won't duplicate unless, I uh, don't actually want the angle. And we got a picture of this from the perfect front here, like this. So this is the face I'm making. Uh, if we don't have that null, a symmetry only does symmetry on the topmost object. Okay, cool. So we got that. I'll probably go ahead and make these. Uh, what color hair will this guy have? I don't know. Let's make another material. No reflectance. We'll make it. Make it yellow. So we'll make the eyebrows yellow. And let's go ahead and make a nice mouth. Uh, I'll just make another circle. I'm going to hit E for move. Move it down. I'm going to make it editable. I'm going to go ahead and grab these two null. Or this points. T for scale. Scale them out. E for move. Move it up. Oh, look how happy he is. I'm going to grab this bottom one. T. Scale it up. Grab this top one. Scale it up. Oh, goodness. Look how happy he is. Um, now we need the loft. So I'm going to copy that loft out. Put that in. Um, what color should the mouth be? That's fun. No, nothing, nothing fancy. A nice, simple face. So now I'm going to say that I want this to be my render view. Um, use as render view. I'm going to create a camera. I'm going to link to said camera. Unlock our attributes. Because I still have that locked from some previous one. I'm actually going to tell this to be... What view are we in? We are in a front view. I'm going to tell this camera to also be... Oh, it is in the front view. Excellent. So it's in the front view, so now I can just go ahead and say zero, 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 zero. So zero it all out. So now we're perfectly centered, which means we can now just zoom. So I'm going to zoom up on the face. It's a little bit offset, so I can grab our camera and maybe tell it to move up so it looks a little more centered. Cool. Render settings. Uh, I always like rendering out square when I'm doing this kind of thing. Um, it just keeps it easier. So I'm going to say a thousand. By a thousand, let's uh, make sure that we're zoomed so we can actually fill the face up. I'm going to go ahead to save, and yes, we do want to save. I want to save as, um, I don't know, could be kind of anything. 
we can save to, I'll just save it as a Photoshop document. So save it as a PSD. I do want an alpha channel because I want to see, yeah, I want an alpha for all the other stuff. And let's go, go ahead and save this into tutorial and save this into my new texture folder. Let's name this face one. Cool. Uh, we got a good resolution. We got the angle. Everything seems to be good. Why don't we go ahead and save this? I'll even save it into the texture folder. Face one. Uh, render. Boom. Okay, cool. We got the face. And if we go to layer, you see that we should have a alpha. So, okay, excellent. Now let's go back into our original guy. Oh, wacky waving. Make a new material in this new material in the color channel. Let's go ahead and track down our nice texture folder. This Photoshop document. Boom. Now we got the face. And now I'm going to drag the same one into our alpha channel. Boom. Turn on alpha and boom. I think instantly it's going to detect the alpha channel and then hide it. So now that's gone. We can go ahead and apply this face onto the mesh. And it's going to look super crazy. But I can grab this face and say I want this to be frontal, flat. And now we can grab the mesh. And now it's really easy to go to the texture tool and the axis. Always turn on the axis because that makes it really easy to move this up. Hit T for scale and scale down. Oh, look at that. He's so happy. I'm going to move this face up a little bit. And I'm going to say don't tile. No tiling. Boom. One little face. Uh, it's mapped on there. It's on the front and back. Um, I'm going to say only front. And now I'm going to limit it to those polygons. So I'm going to go ahead over here and I'm going to select these and these. And I'm going to say I'm going to go ahead and create a selection tag. Set selection. I'm going to even name it right away. Face 1. And now I can go onto my face and say only go to where face one is. So now it won't project on the back. And because I said front, it won't project on the inside either. So now let me just go ahead and hit render to make sure that that, oop, and it's not there. Uh, maybe it's because I said front. This might want to still be on both. Hit render. Okay, cool. Both. So I actually probably want this to be on back. Back. Front. That's weird. I'm going to just leave it on both. I guess it might show up on the inside. I'm not sure why that's happening, but whatever. I'm not going to start out a tiny de detail like that. Uh, so now we get this face. I just want to make sure it's going to stick there. So if I were to hit play, look at that. See how it moves away? It just doesn't stick. So it's really easy to fix that. We just have to right click on our mesh and say uh, stick texture. Boom. Stick texture. I don't even have to record, I don't think. And now I hit play. Oop, I'm on polygons. So we won't see it. Uh, hit play, and now you can see that we said stick texture, and now the face is actually staying on there. So now we got our nice wacky, waving, inflatable arm man with a face. Uh, neat. Okay, now uh, as far as he's concerned, I think there's only one more thing we need to do, and this is going really well. It's working, working great. So the thing that I want to add on here is those little tassels, and you you can see them in most of these images where you get the, like these little tassels up in the head and the hands. So it's kind of like finger little tasselly things. Uh, I can think of a couple different ways of tackling that, but you know, just to make things interesting, why don't we do it with hair? So um, I, I'm actually not even sure about this. Uh, can we grow hair on edges? I don't know that we can, but let's find out. I'm going to go ahead and grab those, that edge, this edge, and this edge, and I'm going to go ahead and say simulate hair objects, add hair. Uh, no, it didn't do anything. So I'm going to undo. Didn't want to do that. Uh, I'm just going to hold down Shift and Polygon. Because what that's going to do is still convert my edge selection to my polygons. And now I have each ring on the top of the head and on the sides of the hands. Now that I've done that, I can go simulate hair objects, add hair. Boom, instantly you're going to see hair pop in. So cool, now we got hair popping in. Looking good. Bunch of things we have to do here, though. First of all, uh, we've got our guides. We're going to want these to be nice and floppy. So I'm going to give them 12 segments so that there's like subdivided to 12 times. They're a little bit long for how big he is. So I'm going to drop these down to maybe 60. Yeah, uh, maybe even 50. Okay, so those aren't super long. And now uh, these are, it's creating one per, po per polygon vertex, so one per point. I actually want these to be in the polygon center. So if I were to click polygon center and say regrow, then now you'll see that we have one per middle of each polygon. And as far as the count is concerned, that looks pretty good to me. I like that. Okay, now, if I were to hit render, you're going to see we're going to get hair, which if you want to have hair on them, that'd be great. Uh, get a little eraser head thing going here, but uh, I don't want there to be hair. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into hairs, and I'm going to say I want each hair to not create 5,000. I don't want 5,000 hairs based on the guides. I want 
each hair to be based off the guide directly. So I'm going to say the root is set to as guides. So now there'll be literally one hair per guide. So cool. Now we got one hair per, and that could be fine for what you want, but I want geometry. So I'm going to go into our generate tab and I'm going to say, don't render hairs. So they're gone now. Instead, create a square spline. Now it is creating a square spline, but they're really thin right now. So I want to make these fatter. We make them fatter by going into our hair material. So we go into our hair material and we go to our thickness. And I'm going to say, I don't know, five and five. So the instant I say five and five, you're going to instantly see, boom, we've got these tassels and they've got some geometry here. Now, something that's kind of interesting is like, okay, these do have this thickness, but maybe, you know, there's a lot of different options. We could say, you know, I don't want them to be square. I want them to be flat. And now we're just going to get these little thin tendrils here. And actually that might be more accurate to what we see here. These little, these don't, those aren't tubes. They're probably just ribbons. So I can't stop jumping back to my face. So these are just thin. I actually might do that. So that's a little more fun. And something that's kind of cool is we could give this even more thickness. Let's say 10 and 10 so they become quite thick but now we can control how they look via this this uh arc right here so i could actually say that they should go in and then out and then in and then out and we're going to get kind of like a little bit more detail on there and that is geometry if i if i show our polygons you can see we have polygons you'll also notice that there are 12 segments i gave it 12 subdivisions so yeah now we can give it that little bit extra detail like that that's thickness now it doesn't care about the specular it doesn't care about the color that's got nothing to do with these hairs they're actual geometry now uh, and those are looking pretty good. These are, these are all hairs. So, uh, what are some other things we might do? Well, um, I might smooth them out so I can create a subdivision surface. I'll set that to one, one, and let's drop in the hairs. Now, actually, here's something I noticed in my practice run is if I hit render, uh, with that, when you put it into a subdivision surface, for some reason, it turns hairs back on. I don't know why it's really weird. So if it's off, no, it doesn't do it. Turn on subdivision surface. Our hairs turn back on. No idea why. Really weird. Uh, I did find a way around it, which is, of course, is when in doubt, use a connect object. So if I had the hair selected, I can hold down Alt or Option, make a connect. I don't even have to weld it. And now when I hit render, they're getting smoothed out and it doesn't create extra weird hairs for some reason. So cool. Uh, so yeah, these are, these are more interesting tassels than maybe the last time I did this. Um, go ahead and hit render. Yep, they're there. Now, uh, technically, based on the way we're subdividing this um, through the subsurface, uh, these are maybe going to be floating a little bit away from the surface i'm just going to ignore that uh, because i don't care right now um i'm gonna go ahead and hit save in fact it's going well so why don't we save it as another version and let's go ahead and hit play and see what happens oh not too bad right away you can see these are reacting quite nicely to everything um a couple things we probably want to do though well actually uh, let's go ahead and hit pause rewind and one thing you're going to notice is for some reason the hair is always lagging a frame behind uh i'm going to move this below it in the hierarchy let's see if it still happens i'm not sure if it will it does look like it when i pause and rewind you're gonna see there's still lag the frame behind while this happens in the viewport it doesn't happen at render time so it's just something we have to deal with uh so while we're playing in the viewport it's always going to look like it's not quite connected but they are so let's go into hairs and we got a couple settings we can do here if we go under uh forces right now it's excluding so no forces are being included and that could be fine but we could say you know what i want them to see the turbulence or the winds. Now, I don't think I want the turbulence. We could try adding in the fraction. Actually, it's set to exclude, so it's seeing all of them. So I'm actually gonna say, no, include. I want you to include the friction. And now if I do that, I just wanna see what happens. I actually, I'm just really curious. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for my own purposes. I'm curious if friction does anything, because it's really hard to tell. See, those are all flopping around. So I'm gonna copy and paste this friction, and I'm going to now tell the hair to see this friction. And I'm going to crank this friction strength way up. I just want to see, oh, it totally does. So friction does work on hair like that. So this is good. Uh, that's a good way of us give, giving this drag. Uh, in fact, we give it its own drag. So we can even name this friction hair. So this one is just for the hair. So I'll just pull this down here. So uh, obviously the 100 is too strong, but maybe 10 will give us a nice little overlap. Yeah, it's a little bit more drifting. Uh, nice. So now we can go into our hair and we could add in our wind so i can add in the wind one wind two and then the original wind and now like as this one blows up through the air like when it gets to the top and it's blowing the air at the top maybe it'll actually push these upward which is fine like a little extra a little extra of something happening there we can also go into our dynamics and we got some different settings here under dynamics we there's a lot of properties as far as like how it's uh, being held and how elastic and how it's resting uh, i tend not to mess with those too much 
Uh, we have a really good modifier here under advanced where we can change it to custom and and make the dynamics a little less floppy. I actually kind of like them floppy, so I'm going to leave that. Actually, where do we find this? Under forces, you see that we have a built-in gravity, which is, could be fine. But these maybe could be drifting a little bit more. So I'm going to set the gravity a little bit weaker. So they're not trying to pull down so up so much. And I really like the way that hands are getting this little overlapping motion on there. Uh, in addition to that, we have two different kinds of forces. We have hair to hair and hair to or surface to hair. So because we have so few hairs, I think we've only got like 24 of them. I don't think the dynamics are going to be slowing us down too much. So I think we can turn on hair to hair, which I think might mean these are trying to like push each other away a little bit. I don't know that we'll see the effect, but it didn't really slow us down. So that's, that's fine. Uh, and here's a radius. So we probably could jump this up to 10. And it'll just try and keep those apart from each other a little bit. And then we have surface to hair. Now, if I were to turn that on, we're not going to see anything right away. But if we go and on our mesh, we right click and add a hair collider, then now every individual hair should be seeing the mesh. So it, this shouldn't pass through the head anymore. It should like whack against the side and keep going. So now we've got this beautiful overlap. Like that's all working really well. Uh, I'm really digging this guy. He's coming out really fun. Uh, let's go ahead and make a material for his uh, his tassels. So I'll just make a new one here. And why don't we even make it a little more interesting? Let's make it a gradient. So I'm going to say gradient. Uh, I don't know how it will apply. So let's just do that to start out with. Let's go ahead and apply that to the hair. Uh, okay, it is the wrong orientation. So I'll say V. So now it's traveling up. So what do we want these to be? I think we want to go from a nice bright, maybe even deep red, all the way up to yellow. So it's kind of got like fire hair. Yeah, look at that. Um, or, yeah, I'm actually not digging the fire that much. Well, maybe let's go to a paler orange. Yeah, that's fine. I like that a little better. Um, cool. So now we've got the tassels there on the face. Looking good. I'm quite happy with that. Give that a quick save. Hit play. Look at that wacky, waving, inflatable arm, man. Uh, doing his thing. All set up. Nice, very clean setup. Like, there's a lot going on in here. But now we just made this character from scratch. Our hair is lagging a little bit. Let's go ahead and... Let's go and set up a quick render. I'm going to say, don't save, output, all frames. Um, we could up the res a little bit, but I'm going to leave it on standard because I just want to see, uh, I want to make sure that the hairs aren't moving. So let's just confirm that. So let's go ahead and save and then hit render. And let's see what we get. So now we're getting our wrinkles because we're getting our subdivisions. And... The hairs do seem to be floating away from the surface a little a little extra than I thought they would. It's hard to tell, but yeah, there does seem to be does seem to be a little floating. I thought in my test that that was not the case. Um, so we'll have to maybe do another step here. First of all, let's move the hair down below everything else, or I'm sorry, our entire mesh down below it, because there could be an order of operations thing happening there as well. So we'll do that. And just out of curiosity, why don't we just go ahead and start the render again? See if that helps. And this is how I test things. It's like, okay, let's see if this is helping. They still seem to be floating a frame away. So I don't know this for sure, but what I, and I, it's not something I want to do, but something that we might have to do to actually have these hairs stick on it properly might be to cache the mesh. So I'm actually, we, we don't need our subdivision surface. I think that our sub poly is doing a great job of that. So what I'm thinking is we might need to right click on our mesh, go to character tags and add a point cache. And now I can say at the time of zero, I'm going to say store the state. And this is a little long right now, so I'll jump it to half the length, 555. Five, five. Store the state. And now I'm going to say calculate. And now it's going to play through the entire timeline. It's all good. Um, it does have to play through the entire thing. You can see it's not eating up too much memory. We're getting to about four or five megs. Should be about six at the end. Boom. Okay, so that's all baked. Now I'm on polygons. So we don't see it. But now if I were to hit play, you see he's still doing his animation. But. Uh, it does seem to be weaking out a little bit, but if I turn off my skin tag, you see our deformer is off. There's no animation happening, but he's still moving. Um, so that means he is now baked. Is All of his motion is now in this baked tag. So, okay, he's flopping around really nice. Um, the hair seems to be stuck slightly better even down here, but now let's see if that helps with our render. Looking better, looking better. Look, these look, these look stuck now. They look like they're right where they should be. Look at these beautiful wrinkles we're getting propagating through the mesh. Now, it does suck a little bit that we had to bake him to be able to make the hairs work. And, of course, the hairs were just something I kind of arbitrarily threw on there. Like, instead of hairs, that could be, sp like, separate spine dynamics. Or those could be, uh, it could be soft body dynamics wedged on there as well. There's a lot of things that you could kind of layer up to make work. But now you see these are indeed stuck 
Um, and he seems to be waving around quite nicely. We're getting our wrinkles. Of course, we have a lot of control over how those wrinkles work. We got our wind blowing up through the body. So like these all overlap. He can't pass through himself because his entire rig is built off of dynamics. Uh, we might need to crank up the, uh, the, uh, the ro I forget what it's called, the rotation preference thing, the uh, follow rotation, because every once in a while his arm might twist on him. Like right there, you see it's twisting a little bit. And it's, it's, it will fix itself, but for right now, it's twisted up right there. And, and our follow rotation is the parameter that fixes that. But this guy's flopping around real nice. Let's go ahead and hit play here, see how this is looking. Wee! Oh, look how happy he is. That's great. And we have any, and uh, we, a lot of these things were just kind of working out of the box uh quite well so like he's flopping around and like the wind is going through him it's all working great there's a lot of things we could do as far as like adding on extra turbulences or um yeah we could add on extra turbulences we could add on extra controls uh we could be adding uh calculating at a certain speed like we could go into our dynamics in fact i'm shocked but we didn't we didn't crank up our steps per frame at any point also we gotta remember we have our cache tag so it won't update unless i say empty cache and now we're live again turn on our deformer so right now we're just running. This is in real time again. Let's go ahead and hit save. Um, so nothing's baked. Now we could go into our our expert tab and we can be like, you know what? I want to be calculating three times as many frames in between each one. And that might help with the arms twisting around. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Um, and then we also have our, under general, we have our gravity. And right now he's on regular gravity. So like we didn't lower that. So his gravity is always pulling him down. Our wind is just pushing him back up again we have our overall time scale. I could say, you know what? I want all these to be calculating twice as fast and it should make him like a lot more, like everything's going to happen quicker. So if this, if this feels a little bit like slow motion, even though I do like the way that looks, it's working really well. Um, we could crank up the time scale and have him be calculating quicker and have everything happen faster. We could have our turbulence, which is actually, you know, the turbulence, which isn't the settings are not crazy on there. We've got our one turbulence, but we could be like, you know what? Like, we want everything a lot crazier. Let's go five, five, five. And now there's a lot more turbulence in the scene where there's more kind of wind blowing around. He's going to dance more. We could uh, probably lower this down. Actually, let's put it down to zero and we'll just see no turbulence. It'll probably take him a second to actually fall over. But now, yeah, now, now there's no wind at all. And now it's just the gravity trying to make him fall and the wind blowing him back straight up again. So we've got a lot of and how strong the wind is blowing as they go up. Right, like right now, these arms are blowing out quite nicely. I'm very happy with the way they are, but we could low weaken those. And in fact, if we were to maybe turn off the arm winds up there, then now you see these are just going to be hanging a lot more limply. And so, yeah, now they're they're a lot more limply, and they're just kind of reacting to the body. But the wind, and you can so clearly see that when we turn these winds back on again, that it's constantly throwing another wave of straightness through the arm. So I don't know, like everything just layers up so nice. What's great now is. We've got our we've got our guy here. We've got our dynamics. We've got our mesh. We've got everything actually named fairly well. We can go ahead and create a new null, and I can go ahead and name him. Uh, uh, what's his name? What wacky, wacky Sam. So this is Sam. Uh, but what's great is I'm pretty sure we should be able to just. I'm gonna give that a save because everything's working really well. I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste them, and I'm gonna scoot them back over here. And I'm going to copy and paste them, and let's put another one right there. So what's great is our materials also copied, and they had to because the vertex maps are separate. But now we can make this guy green, and we can make this guy pink. And, okay, cool. So now we got the three of these guys. Now, here's one thing to note, though, is all three of them, remember, all of the effects are limited to just them. So if I were to hit play right now, all of them are going to work, but look, all of them are moving in the exact same way. That's because each one has their own turbulence and their turbulence moved with them. But something we can do is search for the turbulence, TU, and it should just pop up the turbulences. I can grab each of these and we could give them different settings, but the turbulences are actually relative to their, their coordinates. So I can actually just go to the coordinates and give each one of them a different coordinate. And I can do that here by typing in num uh, NUM times, just to say 888. So now, like the first one is moving, it's uh, num is zero, so it's moving up zero. The next one is one, so it's one times 888. The next one is two times 888. So each of them now has a different axis, and that means by just playing that little bit, 
look, now this arm is just an S-curve. This one's got these extra wiggles. That one looks similar, so maybe I messed this up a little bit. Let's go ahead and type in num time 777. So yeah, now you see this one's curving down, that one's curving out, this one's getting some S-curves. So now uh, all of them have different turbulences, but they all still have the same motion. So I can hit play, and now all of them are moving around doing their own thing. Now, all three are timed perfectly as far as their um, the wind traveling up them. So they're all going to straighten out at the same time. Maybe we don't want that. So what's cool is with Signal, because we built this guy with Signal, we can go into the dynamics of, let's say, SAM2 here, and we only have three Signal tags. So I can grab all three of those, and I'm going to be say, you know what? I want this guy to be on a slightly offset time. He's going to cycle his time every 40 frames. And then let's grab this duplicate and go into the dynamics and grab the tag, grab the tag, grab the tag, and say he's going to take every 55 frames. Not only that, I'm going to type in X plus, actually, let's type in X minus 22. And now he's going to be offset by 22 frames as well. So they all have three different speeds. So now... Uh, the way the wind is traveling up through them and across the arms are all offset. So they're all doing their own thing and they should never repeat. But these are all dynamic objects. These are all dynamic, which means they will actually like, uh, they'll look, they, they'll, they, they can't pass through each other. Like this arm can't pass through that one. They could even probably get tangled up a little bit. Um, and as you know, you saw how easy it was to copy and paste them. We've got a bunch of different ones. They're all piled up. All of it's working really well. Uh, I'm actually quite happy with this. We and I, I wanted to make this tutorial like two years ago, and I tried for like days, and I couldn't get it working. And now that I've kind of got this new thing I've been playing with with all this dynamic rigging. It was like, holy cow, I can go and finally make our wacky waving inflatable arm guys. So here they are, all piled up, dancing around, and they will dance forever, never repeating because we get all this random noise and turbulence going. Um, so yeah, I'll have to come up with a fancy render for these guys, but. Uh, but I think that will wrap this up. They're all piled up. Everything's looking good. Remember, uh, if you want, if you're doing this hair technique, you'll probably have to bake the meshes so that you know, so that the hair actually stays stuck on them. But uh, <laughs> and they're they're waving goodbye. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, this one was a lot of fun. So uh, I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.